Attention all personnel. Incoming podcast. This is MASH Matters. Welcome once again to MASH Matters, the podcast celebrating the greatest television show of all time. I'm Ryan Patrick alongside Jeff Maxwell. And we have somebody very special with us today. Jeff, would you please introduce us? Well, we have a special guest today, a very special guest. And I met him a long, long time ago. Uh, We have not gone square dancing since at all, but uh, (laughs) I know him to be extremely talented. He is a multi-talented guy. He's a producer, writer, director. Uh, He's written a whole bunch of books. And what is especially interesting about him for this particular podcast called MASH Matters is the fact that he produced and wrote and directed two, count them two, documentary-ish kind of shows about MASH. He did Making MASH and Memories of MASH, and we're going to find out all the details about how he did that, why he did that, and how he still feels about all that MASH stuff. So welcome, Mr. Michael Hirsch, to MASH Matters. I'm happy to be here. Cool. Delighted, in fact. Well, you haven't been here long enough for that, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll take care of that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Not a problem. Well, so did you produce, write, and direct both of those shows? I produced, wrote, and directed Memories of MASH. I produced and wrote Making MASH, and my late friend Pat Denny was the director on Making mash so kind of before we get into all that mash stuff which i want to do can you kind of fill us in on your background and your history and sort of where you came from and how you became this guy sure right now i consider myself a recovering journalist (laughs) i've been a journalist since sixth grade when i started the elementary school newspaper and did my very first interview with a magician who came to entertain at the school. (laughs) And I have no idea how I knew how to conduct an interview, but I started it in sixth grade and I don't think I've really ever stopped. Wow! I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign for one year and uh, flunked out because I was in pre-med and really had no business being in (laughs) pre-med. I was spending too much time hanging out at the Daily Illini. I ended up moving to California, going to Santa Ana College, then living with my grandparents in Los Angeles. And uh, I had a camera and I had a police and fire radio in the car. And every night I'd go out chasing police and fire stuff and taking pictures and selling them to the LA Times or the other newspapers in town. And I kept running into a man named Jim Zalian, who was the father of Stephen Zalian, who wrote Schindler's List, among other things. Mm -hmm. And he was working for KNX and he was out in a mobile unit every night. And he finally said, we keep running into each other. Why don't you ride with us? So I started riding with him and uh, somebody suggested you know, you'd make more money shooting 16 millimeter film. And I went out and bought an old 70 DL camera, a World War II type Bell and Howell camera yeah. and began shooting news film. And I was at the time going to uh, w- was then LA State uh, majoring in journalism. And uh, one day Zalian said, there's a job opening at the station. Essentially, it was for the afternoon and evening gopher. And it paid $68 a week. This was 1963. That's not bad. No, not bad, really. But I I made a decision to take the job, go to school part-time and work full-time, knowing that that would expose me to the draft. And I was okay with that because... Not that my family had had any serious conversations about this, but my father had been a doctor on board a troop transport ship in World War II, and I just felt that if your country says they need you, you go. Sure. Now, this was before we figured out what Vietnam was. Yeah. So, I ended up getting a draft notice, and a couple of people at KNX knew the colonel in charge of uh, relating to the film industry and the armed forces radio and television colonel, and they interviewed me. And they wrote very nice letters about me to the Army Chief of Information's office in Washington. And so I I ended up going to basic training at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And every week or two, I'd get a letter from the Pentagon, which did nothing but piss off the drill sergeant and the captain. (laughs) You know, what is what is this guy doing getting letters from the Pentagon? Yeah. And they asked me where I'd like to go. And I said, well, I'd like to go to Europe. And they said, sorry, we're not sending draftees to Europe. And so ultimately, they sent me home to Chicago, <laughs> which was sort of interesting. I became the editor of the newspaper at Fort Sheridan, Illinois, which is in the north suburbs. And I did that for seven or eight months. And then somebody decided they needed to establish public information detachments like they had used in World War II. These are five-man units that they could move around quickly. And they were looking for experienced journalists, such as you can be experienced at my age at the time. How how old were you at that point? I was 22. In in any event, 
we got levied, uh, sent to Fort Ben Harris in Indiana, and we went, went by troop ship to Vietnam. And we're attached to the 25th Infantry Division at Cu Chi, which is about 20 miles northwest of Saigon. And this was in early 1966. So I was a combat correspondent until the end of the year. Came home, finished my degree at the University of Illinois, began working for the CBS radio station in Chicago, WBBM. I was a reporter on the streets of Chicago in 1968, which was an incredible year for news. Not only the assassinations and the riots that happened, but the 1968 Democratic National convention. Good grief. Yeah. Wow. So I, I saw a lot in my very early years as a as a reporter and then moved from AM to FM where I was hosting a nightly talk show at late at night, midnight. Mm-hmm. And then came the CBS layoffs where they laid off 15% of the people at every division of CBS, including the New York Yankees. And uh, that ultimately was a good thing because it led me to public television. And I spent 18 years plus in public TV. Wow. Very cool. What a journey. What a journey. Very interesting. The station in Chicago, WTTW, had been a very sleepy place that did nothing locally. And a new general manager and president came in, a guy named Bill McCarter. And after about six months, he called me into his office and he said, there's only two people in this station who know how to produce television shows and you're one of them. Mm. From now on, your job is to put this place on the map. Wow. No pressure. (laughs) No no pressure, but it was like a blank check, which means all I needed was to go in with a good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd tell him what it would cost and this sort of thing and how long it would take to get it done. And he never said no to me. Oh, hmm. And that, frankly, is how making MASH happened. Mm. I had done a number of other things. I won eight Emmys there, won a Peabody Award, and a bunch of other stuff that my wife is tired of dusting. <laughs> <laughs> and I came in, I said, I want to do this MASH program. He said, okay, great. I think it's a great idea. Now we just have to figure out how to make the program director think it was his idea. (laughs) The program director was against the idea, he once told me much later, because he thought it would be embarrassing if I failed. (laughs) Fortunately, the president of the station overruled it, and we ended up doing Making Mash. So this was going to be produced, or you were going to do this project for them, not for CBS or a network? No, this was for public television. Public television, okay. Memories of Mash, the 20th anniversary show was for CBS. I wonder why MASH? What what about MASH? Is this because of your military background, the medical background of your dad? And well, did all that kind of come together and, and create no, the idea? B- back up a little. I had done an, a show for PBS at WTTW about censorship of entertainment programs by the commercial networks. It was called You Should See What You're Missing. <laughs> and we came out to LA and interviewed Larry Gelbart, Susan Harris, and Abby Mann, Joe Wamba, Danny Arnold, about the things they wanted to do on TV but couldn't, or how the networks messed with what they were doing. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I just had an interest in television and how this incredible resource was being used or misused. Mm-hmm. And that led to doing that particular program. I mean, th- the rules have changed a lot. At the time, I needed to be able to get clips of the shows that these people were talking about. And the lawyers ruled that I couldn't just tape them off the air. I had to get the tape from someone who would have legitimately had reason to possess it. <laughs> This was before the age of, you know, VHS and Betacam tapes. Right, right. And that made life really difficult. Now, when you look at television, you see people pulling stuff from other shows and using them at length on their programs all the time. Mm -hmm. So for that program, I interviewed Larry Gelbart on the MASH set. He had just left the show. It was... It was between the fourth and fifth seasons, but we went over to stage nine and we did the interview there. Mm -hmm. And of course, we watched MASH. You know, I loved MASH as a show. Mm -hmm. And then I said to Gelbart, you know, someday I want to come back and do a documentary about how you make MASH. And in 1978 or 79, there was talk that MASH was going to come to an end. It was way premature, but I said, I need to do something about this. And uh, there was a TV critic at the Chicago Tribune named Gary Deeb, and he and I were friends, and he was going out to LA, and he was going to be meeting with the people on MASH and whatever. And I said, tell them I want to come back and do this show. And he said, okay. And he came back from LA, and he said, here's a number, call them. And so at the time, I think I called and spoke with Burt Metcalf and with whoever else at Fox I had to talk to. And it was very easy to get them to okay letting me do it. And and I think, I don't believe at the time they had had any experience with a serious journalist wanting to look at what they do and how they do it and present that to the public. 
you know, they, they've had television crews come in, but they didn't have anybody hanging out for three months, really observing what's going on Mm -hmm. and trying to uh, explain it on film to the, to the viewing public. Yeah. So you basically had to, you went to them and said, here, here's my idea. This is what I want to do. And they said, Hey, sounds like a good idea. You seem like the right guy to do it. You know what you're talking about. And you're a journalist and you understand this. And, and that's why they said, okay, I I would assume. Lord knows why Fox would say anything. (laughs) Well, let's stop there. I mean, you certainly have a feeling about 20th Century Fox. What, what was that like? Why, why did this happen to you? What was it about Fox? I, I, it's just the, the experience that I had, one, one incident. When, when we finished the program and PBS was going to schedule it, but they weren't going to air it for about six months because they were going to use it as a pledge program. And so uh, we brought the show out and we had a party on the set of Stage 9 for all the cast and crew. And we uh, showed the program to them and everybody was thrilled and delighted. And then a couple of months later, we began having legal problems with Fox. They, they were talking about ownership and you know the charges, the price for the clips and this, that, and the other thing. And it got to the point where it was a stalemate and I needed to do something. So I called Alan Alda. And his assistant at the time, Rosie Cheverini, who knew me, said, I'll tell him what's going on and he'll get back to you. And Alan called me back and I explained the problem. He said, I'll take care of it. And what I understood happened is that Alan called whoever he has to call at the Fox headquarters building and said, production has just been halted and it won't start up again until I get a call from Mike Hirsch saying he's happy. (laughs) Oh, oh, wow. (laughs) That's a good Alan, Alda. (laughs) Yeah. So... Production started up in about 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I had a similar experience. I'll do this real quick. I came up with the idea of, of writing a book called Secrets of the Mash Mess, The Lost Recipes of Private Igor, which eventually came out. And the publisher said, hey, this is great. We love it. Let's do it. They said, here, we're going to pay you this. I said, OK, everything was a go. Of course, 20th Century Fox had to sign off on it. And initially, I sent them a proposal and they said, yeah, hey, cute idea. Go ahead and do it. And then at the very last minute, the publisher called and said, hey, Fox won't let you do it. They don't want to do it. They said, forget it. No, no book. And I freaked out because it was halfway written and I put on all this work and I said, I don't know what to do. So I called Larry Gelbart and he said, send me the proposal. I sent him the proposal. And in, in two days, I got a postcard in the mail from, and it says, Larry Gelbart, done. <laughs> <laughs> and 20 minutes later, I swear to you, the publisher called and said, I don't know what you did, but they're all go. Fox is in. <laughs> so, so those guys had some clout. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah. members of the cast had issues with Fox all along. Jamie had problems not being treated right. Bill Christopher had problems not being treated right. They're, they're on a show that's making Fox money that's just coming out of the tap. And they would cheap it out with their name cast members. Mm-hmm. We, we're jumping all around here, but eventually... One day in Chicago, I this is after Making Mash aired on PBS, and it was a huge ratings hit. In in L.A., it beat KNXT in the ratings. It, it beat uh, WCBS in New York in the ratings when it aired. So one day in Chicago, I'm at the public TV station. The phone rings, and it's Larry Gelbart saying, um, I'm coming to Chicago. Would you like to have lunch? Which is, to me, like you know the Pope calling the parish <laughs> yeah. priest and asking if yeah. he can drop by. And I said, sure. And we had lunch and he said, we're going to do a sequel. And I said, I want to work on it with you because I, they needed story research and they were trying to do it with freelancers or whatever. And I had a deal at the public television station at the time where I got three months off with pay every year. And at the time that I was having lunch with Larry, I had six months in the bank. And I said, okay, I'll, I want to come out and work with you. And so I went out there and took over all the story research. They began to refer to Aftermath as the only sitcom in town with a staff documentarian. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Wow. And to wind up the raps on Fox, they weren't paying me very much, not nearly as much as I'd been making in public television. And I I was with the show for a year. I I, I was in all the pre-production which meant I spent a lot of time in in Larry's office in the pool building at his home in Beverly Hills, just Larry and myself, which was incredible. Talk about a learning experience. Yeah. But eventually at the end of the first season, you know, they were talking about, you know, contracts for the new year. And Fox offered me, again, less than I was making at CBS. And they wouldn't budge. And uh, nobody was able or willing to get into a fight with them over me. And so I left the show. 
So you made an interesting comment. You said spending time with, with Larry Galbert was a learning experience. What was that like? What was the learning experience? What did you learn in a few words? <laughs> what was that? It was, it, it was watching his mind work and see what triggers his mind and what he thought he needed and why he needed it. One experience I had with Larry, or one interchange I had with him, this was while we were still doing Aftermash, the, he was writing an episode about the atomic veterans, the GIs who were at the atomic test sites and began coming down with all sorts of horrible diseases and weren't being treated well. It was a very serious subject for what is essentially a sitcom. And he wrote the script and in it, he had this goofy thing where the hospital administrator had hired two painters to paint stripes on the floors to help people get to where they were going. And, and it was a running gag throughout the show. And they started at one point painting in different directions and in different colors. And by the time the show was ended, they had come all the way around and ended up because they were doing this backwards, obviously, you know, you don't crawl forward. And you paint, you paint and go backwards. And they ended up coming around in a complete circle, bumping butts. Mm -hmm. And it was just dumb silliness. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to Larry, I said, why did you do something like that? And he says, because that gave me permission to do the serious stuff. Ah. And if you apply that to a lot of the episodes that he was involved in in his four years on the show, you'll see a lot of that. I mean, Klinger's a great example. Klinger gave them permission to do serious stuff, to have somebody die. By having the comic guy, the funny stuff happening, you could then go click and somebody dies in a second later. Right. And that's a lesson that stayed with me for dozens of years when I wrote my second novel, a book called Fly Unzipped. The character's name is Fly. And it deals with sex trafficking of American minor girls here in Southwest Florida, where I live. I consciously wrote the book very MASH-like. There is some absolutely stupid comedy stuff in there that makes the serious subject of sex trafficking of minor girls work. So, so a great lesson from a, from a master guy. I mean, he was an incredible, what an incredible brain he had. Uh, it, was, it was phenomenal. He had he had just an incredible way with words. If if you haven't, there may be a tape of it around someplace. But the play Mastergate that he wrote, mm -hmm. the wordplay in it is just brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible. Oh yeah, uh, uh, Ryan grew up being a fan of Mash, and I kind of grew up sort of working there. <laughs> <laughs> so we we have a little different perspective. I he certainly bonded with like all audiences did bonded with the characters, and I bonded with the people and the experience of being there. So I didn't become uh, so enamored with the characters. I became enamored with all the people. I loved everybody there. Mm -hmm. But what, what was your experience? Did you walk in? You, you were a fan. You were watching the show. Did you walk into this environment and kind of be affected by the fact that you were, watched all these people and kind of became familiar with the characters? Or were they just the actors? Was it just showbiz? First time I'm on the set, Chuck Panama, the PR guy, yeah. brings me in, introduces me to people, and has me sit down, you know, in one of the director chairs where the cast hangs out. Yeah. And most of the people were working, and I was sitting there just watching. And Harry Morgan came over and introduced himself. And he said, would you like a cup of coffee? And I jumped up. And he said, no, no, stay. I'll get it for you. <laughs> And that was my introduction. Yeah. I, I, David Ogden Stiers was, was wonderful and wonderful to me, but not above doing uh, pranks. <laughs> At one point, I was coming out of the old writer's building, and my associate producer, a woman from Chicago, Marianne Duarte, came running up to me, and she said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I said, what do you mean? Nothing's wrong. She said, well, Styers just told me that you were really very upset with me and something was terribly wrong. <laughs> you know, he had no shame. He, he, he would do stuff like that. I made up for it by getting into his dressing room and filming the orange and purple that the other uh, cast members had it painted while they were on, yes. on a break. <laughs> yes. da David and I just yeah. hit it off. He, 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 he would, you know, he was strange. <laughs> we, we went together to see the space shuttle land out at Edwards Air Force Base. He, he picked me up at my house in Calabasas at about four in the morning or three in the morning. And we, we drove out there and he, he was smoking dope the entire way out there. <laughs> We, we get out there, and, and the sun is barely coming up, 
and he's got sunglasses on and a hoodie, and he's trying to keep from being recognized. And at one point, there was like a 10-year-old kid who figured out who he was. And it was it just made him uncomfortable. He just didn't want to be known. Gosh. And I'll just tell you one more story about David. And I'm not sure when this was. This has to be, I don't know why Masher was being shot. It may have been, but my my wife, Karen, and our two kids, uh, Bill and Jennifer, had come out. And Jennifer was like nine years old. And David invited us over to his house in the Silver Lake District. And we came in. And you walk in, and then you got to go down a bunch of very steep stairs to get to the living area. And he picked up my daughter and carried her down the stairs, just like, you know, he was her uncle. <laughs> and it was just an incredibly sweet moment. I, I'm, I'm so sad that, that he has passed away. Yeah, it's very sad. In fact, as a sort of a, in preparation for this conversation, I, I watched uh, Memories of MASH and... Uh, you know, it, it, it was very difficult to see so many people who had passed away. I, I, I got very emotional because it was, uh, you know, these are people that I cared about. Yeah. Everybody cared about. <laughs> and uh, to, to lose them, it was very sad. It was a rough view, although the shows were fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, really, I have to say that you, you did a remarkable job. They were terrific programs. Thank you. And you handled them well and you shot them well and they looked good and they sounded good. You know, I hadn't seen anything in quite some time. And so really it, a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there's one other guy I need to mention. That's McLean Stevenson. Mm-hmm. Um, my uh, co-producer and I, when we were working on Memories of MASH, we were pre-interviewing all the people we were going to interview. And we went over to Mac's office at a health clinic that I guess he was one of the benefactors of. And we thought it would be a 15-minute conversation. And we spent two hours talking to him. He just wanted to tell us everything, including why he left the show. Hmm. And w- what he said was really very, very personal. It, he was, I guess, going through a divorce or had been divorced. And he said, leaving the show to do, what was it they offered him? as something called Hello, Larry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Meant that he would then be able to get either shared custody or custody of his daughter. Wow. That's what made the difference, the money from, from that oh, show. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And that's why he left MASH. And I don't know that I ever used that and in fact, I'm reasonably sure I've never used that in the in a broadcast. But I made a tape of it, yeah, yeah. and gave the tape to Ginny, his wife, his widow. And I said, "You and your daughter, um, or Max McLean's daughter, may find this of some comfort." But it's just, I mean, you're not doing an interview; you're really doing a conversation. And if you hit it off with the person, you just talk. Yeah, Jamie was fun. In fact, when I was doing Making Mash. When we got back to Chicago and had to start editing, I said, we're going to start with the Klinger segment because I knew it would be fun and it would work because we had gone into wardrobe. What was Albert's last name, the wardrobe guy? Uh, oh, boy. Oh, Frankel? Frankel. Frankel. Okay. Frankel. See, Ryan knows everything. And they pulled out costumes and it was just fun. And so we cut the, the Klinger segment. And then I was able to show that to the management, and but they basically knew the show was going to work. Mm-hmm. Had an interesting time with Alan on Memories of Mash because he was in a battle with Fox again, and Alan was in London doing a play, mm-hmm. and so we had to go to London to interview him. It, it was touch and go. My co-producer and I were literally in a car on the way to LAX when we get a call that says, don't go, Alan won't do the interview because Fox hasn't agreed on whatever it was. <laughs> oh. And it's like, wait a second, we're, we're, we're literally on the 405 going to LAX. The plane is leaving in three hours. The tickets are paid for. We're going. So we got there, and somehow in the interim, it got resolved, and we interviewed Alan on the stage of the theater where he was doing the play. But that doesn't make your gut feel real good when (laughs) you're going into that kind of situation. (laughs) No, sure didn't. Uh, Now, Memories of MASH is really well known among MASH fans. That particular documentary is readily available. You can find that. You can watch it. 
However, making mash is personally, it's my white whale. I have never seen it. I've seen bits and pieces of it, but I've never seen the full documentary and I would love to see it sometime, but it's, it's not as readily available. And one question is, why is that so? And the other question is, in your pre-planning for doing the documentary, did you set out to say, we're just going to roll film and watch them make a show? That was the plan from the get-go or did it evolve over time? It evolved over time. And we and we could never just go in and you know, just point a camera and start shooting because at the time film was very expensive. It was a huge part of the budget. You know, you got the cost of film stock, the cost of processing, the cost of making a work print. It was just very very expensive, and you just had to be disciplined over your shooting ratio. Once things went to videotape, that all changed. You could let the camera just roll and get everything you wanted. Where you paid the price later on was in the editing room because now you're dealing with hours and hours and hours of stuff instead of minutes. Mm-hmm. I I came out and spent time watching first and figuring out everything we needed to do so we could shoot a writing session. We could shoot a table reading. I knew I needed to talk to people who were directing. And and most of the time in this show, I think I talked to Charles Dubin. But it was all pretty much planned out what we needed because I also had a clear access to it. you know. So they knew this is what I I was going to ask for, that I wasn't just going to come in and shoot some B-roll of them doing stuff and try and make a show out of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, With respect to making MASH not being available, at one point Fox wanted to syndicate it, but they said they couldn't do a deal with Mary Tyler Moore, who I'd gotten to do the narration for it. So they asked me to redo the narration. So I did the narration on it. And I don't know whether they syndicated it or not. The problem ultimately came down that WTTW in Chicago, the public television station, owns the show, but Fox owns the clips. Uh, uh, yeah. And never the twain shall meet. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't made available that way. Well, and that, and that makes sense. I mean, obviously, when you've got different clips and different people claiming ownership of different parts of the show, obviously, it's a, that's it's a problem. Yeah, it's a problem. There's one other thing, just so I don't forget it, I just want to tell you. As we were shooting Making Mash, there was one single moment when I knew they were taking me seriously. I, I got a message saying that Burt Metcalf wanted to see me in the old writer's building. And I got there and he said, yesterday when you shot a writing session, Alan Alda was involved and the writers are very upset because they wanted it made clear that Alan normally doesn't write the show, that he was sitting in on that session because they were working on a script that he had written. Hmm. So they asked that I make that clear. And I think in the program, there's a line that pretty much says that. As you're talking about this, it's, you know, you're you're outlining and, and discussing the business of show business, kind of how things are really made and the spine of all of that. Again, it's one of the kind of situations between Ryan and I as a fan and a guy who worked there. You see that. I, to me, it was a business. I made money. I earned a living. I loved everybody. It was a wonderful job, but it was still a business. And it, it didn't have the emotional impact that being a fan of the show would would have had on me at a different kind of emotional impact. But the things you're talking about, Fox and the issues with the writers going, well, you know, we don't want we're Alan's, you know, the thing about Alan, gee whiz, we want everybody to know we're doing it, not Alan. All those things are kind of behind the scenes of what goes on, you know, of a television show and how that works. Even though it's a beloved television show, even if it's probably the best television show ever, all that stuff still goes on. And and it's a tribute to, you know, in the case of MASH, I think it's an attri- a tribute to Gene Reynolds. Yes. Who, as the executive producer, kept all that stuff going, kept the crap away from the cast. Yeah. Fought the battles, won most of them, lost some of them. Yeah. If you don't have that kind of person at the helm, things tend to get away. How was your relationship with him? How did that work? It, it was fine. It wasn't as close as it was with Larry. Gene was never casual. Yeah. <laughs> and Larry was often casual. Yeah. That's the simplest way to put it. But Gene, you know, respected what what we were doing, knew what I needed. They used to do a a session when they were finishing up a script, there'd be a meeting at Gene's house in the evening that he and Alan and Burt Metcalf and the writer who was involved with it would attend. And that was just, you know, one last shot at making the script as perfect as they could get it. Mm Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question. So w- when you were on the set, did you have the sense that the word that was on the page were the words that better come out of your mouth? Oh, absolutely. I, in fact, I think I said something else once and I still have the scars on my back to prove it. I mean, they were they just whip you. It was a terrible <laughs> experience. No, I, there was no... Uh, 
you know, I do know that at the table read, if you had an idea and you wanted to say something and they said, no, I don't think I should say that or say this, that was a, a time that you would get to, to express it. And maybe they would think about it, maybe they wouldn't. But when they get on the set and they're saying roll action, no, you said exactly those words, period. And why not? Because at that point, those words were about the most perfect words you could probably come up with. You weren't going to get better than what was on that page. On a completely different note, when I was working on Aftermath, the, the deal I had, I was supposed to have been called associate producer, but then Bert ultimately came to me and said, no, Stan Tischler has that title and always has, and he's not comfortable sharing it. So I became something called program coordinator, whatever that was. But I spent much time in the writer's room and I got to do something I'd never, ever done before is sit in on casting sessions. Oh, gosh. And that really surprised me. First of all, I don't know how you, you actors deal with the rejection. I mean, they'd have the smallest part, you know, four lines, and they'd bring in eight people to read for it. And they'd read for it, and at the end, one person or the other would say, thank you very much, and the person would leave, and they would never know why or why not they got the job. Well, certainly the acting business is very difficult when you're talking about auditions. Auditions are just awful. As a guy out in Los Angeles, you go into audition for something and you're sitting and talking to a casting director and they're a little blase. You know, they've seen 18 people, you know, saying the same thing over and over. So you don't have a great contact initially, but it's a very difficult thing to, as you say, you, you pour your heart out, you say all the words, and then they say, thank you so much. And you get up and walk out of the room and you just don't know. If you don't get the job, you're never going to know why you didn't get the job. You walk out feeling a, a great deal of loss <laughs> for a while. Now, as a, as a trained actor, you can take classes in Los Angeles and train yourself for the audition process and get a sense about how you can recover or how you can go into it and say, hey, look, I don't care if I get this job. This is the only time I'm going to be able to say these words. So I'm going to go in and just enjoy the heck out of it. That's a real good mindset to have if you can walk into an audition like that. However important, whether it's four words or 400 words, you say, this is the only time I'm going to do it. So if I don't get it, I don't care. It's really fun to do. So how did you get Igor? Uh, well, it's a long story. <laughs> um, at, at some point, I was a casting director at 20th Century Fox, and I left that job to go off and perform around the country. Ironically, to go to Korea and perform in USO tours. <laughs> anyway, I came back and uh, my partner and I had kind of split up and I was kind of depressed and sitting around talking to my casting director friends about the experience. And they said, hey, well, there's this new show called MASH and it's not doing very well in the ratings. And we think we can get you a little part if you want to try, you know, being an actor. And I said, ah, I don't know. I don't like actors. I like comedians. That's where I live. That's my head. I don't know. Actor, smacker. And they said, well, do it. It's, we can do it. So they did it. I went there and it just felt right. It worked. I was able to be funny and they appreciated what I was doing. And I thought, well, okay, I could do this. And that's kind of the way it worked. From that point on, it was just, you know, nine years later, that was it. <laughs> okay. I, I have one more question for you. Yes, sir. The liver and fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We want something else. Yeah. We want something else. A anybody who watches MASH has to know that scene. <laughs> yeah. Describe the shooting of that scene. <laughs> you know, this is really a tough question. I and Ryan, you've heard me try and do this before, haven't you? We've talked about this. Yes, yes. I struggle a little bit with it because it was a while ago. The biggest thing I remember about it is that when Alan started freaking out and doing his stuff, yes. I was blown away by his little dance. Do you remember that dance he does? Absolutely. His legs, it just looked like his legs were made out of rubber and they're going opposite directions and he's doing it and he's waving his arms around. I thought, how does a person do that? <laughs> Where does that come from? And that really blew me away. And, and it showed on your face. <laughs> yeah, it did. Well, it did. I, you know, it was a stunning moment watching Alan Alda freak out and go through that process. And it was a fun thing for me just to stand there and watch him do it. And and I need you to describe just because I've never gotten a good description of it. The throwing of all the food. Yeah. It, you know, I, I honestly don't remember too much about it other than there were cuts. Like they had a two shot of radar and clinger or something. And somebody just slung the food at him. Yes. 
And Alan, I guess, did throw food in the initial shot. And from that point, I wish I could be more uh, specific. I don't remember at all. Okay. I want to steer back here for just a moment to Aftermash, because we don't have the opportunity to talk to as many people who were involved with Aftermash as we do with MASH. You know, Aftermash, while it was a hit on CBS, it obviously was never going to be able to catch the magic that MASH did. What were your feelings of working on Aftermash while you were working on it? And now, in retrospect, looking back, what are your feelings about Aftermash? The the retrospective feeling, which started probably while the show was still on the air, maybe a little later, is that the mistake was making it a half-hour sitcom. It should have been a St. Elsewhere's type show in a VA hospital after the Korean War. Mm -hmm. My experience working on on Aftermath was I, I tracked down about 150 veterans and VA administrator types and nurses and doctors who worked in VA hospitals at the end of and after the Korean War and interviewed them about their experiences. And it's from those interviews that they pulled the serious storylines and then could work at funnying them up. And and it just leads me to, this is sort of like a pat on my own back, but I was sitting in the writing room and I had given everybody a bunch of transcripts a few days before. The theory was they would take the transcripts home and highlight what they like from them and try and outline a story. Sitting in the writing room, they outlined a story which you came away with with was an outline that was so detailed, it might have been 15 pages long to give to the writer who was actually going to flesh it out and write it. But Gelbart started by saying, I find myself when I'm reading the transcripts, highlighting the questions more often than the answers. <laughs> and that was like just high praise sure. for me at the time. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, I was a whole lot younger. It was just a different world for me to become part of and to have praise from him was just incredible. He was just such an extraordinary man and uh, a nice person. You just don't get a lot of that. You get extraordinary and kind of an idiot or <laughs> vice versa. But he had all of that. He was an extraordinary talent, gifted writer, and just a nice guy. And I think that personage, and uh, along with uh, Gene Reynolds' elegance and the way he was able to handle all these uh, high voltage <laughs> actors and people and still make everything work right and smoothly, those guys as a team, it was amazing, amazing. And to be absolutely honest, the show wasn't the same when the team broke up. Well, that's a good point. What what was different? What do you think was different? What did you sense uh, was different? Well, the first four seasons were the Gelbart years, the Gelbart and Reynolds years, and then the fifth season was just Gene. And then by the sixth season, Gene was gone. Burt Metcalf, who had been hired initially as the to cast the show and became the associate producer, by the sixth season, Burt became the executive producer. And Alan Alda took more and more control of the program. And it seems, uh, it's no secret, it seems the direction of the show changed. And how? I, I think in the first four years... The show, the scripts were pretty true to the time they were taking place in, the attitudes of the people, the things that happened. By season, well, it started in six and maybe, you know, seven and eight, the, the social mores that were being evolved, were evolving in the 70s, in the late 70s permeated the program. As a regular viewer, Ryan, did you have that sense? Do you have a, a feeling about that change? There was a shift. Now, the the challenge for me as a viewer is, you know, I was very young, but I, I did watch it when it was on the air, but I watched it when I was a kid. I honestly didn't start really diving in and becoming a super fan of the show until later when I was in high school and college. That's when I really started watching the show. And because of that, I watched the show out of order. I, I didn't watch it from pilot to final episode. It was on syndication. So I watched whatever was on. So I, I didn't notice a change because I would watch one episode from season two and then another episode from season seven and then a third episode from season 10 because because that was just how it was in syndication. Now that you have the DVDs and you can watch it on Hulu and you can watch the evolution of the show, yeah, I can see some of that. But... I also know all of the shows, so I'd be very interested in hearing somebody's view who's watching it for the very first time from the pilot episode to the last episode and get their opinion on how the show evolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is something that just struck me as you were talking, but I was thinking about the writing staffs, and the writing staffs, I'm pretty sure I'm accurate here, the writing staffs in the first four years 
were older. Yeah. I mean, there were guys that, that Gelbart had worked with mm-hmm. yep. bef- before tele- BT, before television. <laughs> <laughs> and as you got past the sixth season, the writers were much younger and didn't have the kind of life experience that the guys who wrote in the first four years had. Yeah, they were. And they definitely, you know, the uh, some of the people that wrote while Larry Gelbart was there had written for the Andy Griffith show. Those two gentlemen's names I can't remember right now, but Greenbaum and- uh, Everett Greenbaum, Everett Greenbaum. Jim Fritzell and Everett Greenbaum. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So th- yeah, th- there's were a, a, an older group of people and certainly, and even in some of the directors as well. Hi, Averbeck. Yeah. Jackie Cooper. Jackie Cooper, yeah. <laughs> oh, Jackie Cooper. It's funny, when I first got uh, associated with the show, I didn't know Alan Alda. I wasn't familiar with anybody there. But when I showed up one day to do a, a little moment in the show, Jackie Cooper was a director. Him, I did know. So I was very nervous. <laughs> Jackie Cooper was a director. I was terrified. <laughs> you know, on uh, Memories of Mash, you had a wonderful hostess. And Shelley Long was a terrific person. She looked beautiful in that. You shot her gorgeous. <laughs> Everybody looked gorgeous in that show. How was it determined Shelley Long was going to be the host? You, you think about who you'd really like, and then you deal with who the network would really want. Mm. I don't remember what other candidates there were, but somehow we came up with Shelley Long. Mm-hmm. And I'm from Chicago. She's from Chicago. And uh, somehow she said yes. Well, she had been a guest star on one of the episodes of MASH. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, we looked at people who had been guest stars on the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember she came out, She we were out shooting out at the MASH ranch, and she uh, jumped out of the car, and I, I don't remember the line, but she gave me a line from one of the furniture store commercials that she was all over Chicago television with before she moved to LA. <laughs> and she was just terrific, was willing to try anything, including the move from the helicopter. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty fun. Yeah, to see her fly in. That was really cool. So how did you get Mary Tyler Moore for making MASH? This is my public television mind thinking. I needed somebody who would have the credibility to say that MASH is, I I forget if we said the best show on television or one of the best shows ever on television. And it was a very short list of people. And I said, I want Mary Tyler Moore to do it. And, uh, you know, the answer was, if you can get her, go ahead and get her. I mean, I didn't have to deal with a network, you know, to get approval. And I remember calling her agent and I don't remember who he was. And I said, this is what we're doing. I know she's friends with Alan Alda. Um, this is what we'd like her to do. It's all voiceover. We'll record it wherever she would want to do it. And he said, well, I don't know why she would want to do it, but I'll take it to her. <laughs> and the next day he came back and he says, I don't know why she said yes, but she wants to do it. <laughs> and then I broached the question of money. And he said, it really doesn't matter. You can't afford her anyway. <laughs> he said, what can you pay? And I said, $2,000? <laughs> and he said, well, that's okay. Oh, my gosh. Wow. <laughs> and so oh, we met her in a audio studio in New York City and recorded it. Wow. That's great. Wow. How cool. I mean, the key there was it's MASH. It's MASH. Yeah. You know, I wasn't saying I'm doing a documentary about Fear Factor. Yeah. <laughs> will, you, will you narrate it, please? <laughs> my mother of the car. I'd yeah, love to do a documentary about it. My mother of the car. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, you don't have to play the mother, but if you could sound like the mother's <laughs> grandmother, that would be good. So that's that's how we got. But it was, I mean, all modesty aside, I think we, we had a great cut of the show and we knew the show was terrific. And so getting a narrator like Mary Tyler Moore was just making it one little bit better. But that's also a lesson from MASH. MASH also did things to just make it one little bit better. One little bit better. Yeah, they did. And Memories of MASH, I, I love this, the interview you did with Gary Berghoff when he was talking about the hug between he and McLean in that last shot when he flies off in the helicopter. He, talking about the fact that the hug was really genuine. He was hugging Gary rather than the two characters hugging. It was really between those two people. And him saying that kind of took him back. And it, it was interesting to see him say, gee, I'm so affected by that still all from all those years ago. And that he, he was glad that he had still had that, you know, that passion and that feeling. It was really touching to watch that. Really was. You got some great stuff in there. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were things, you know, going up and watching David Stars conduct the orchestra in Oregon and then shoot with his parents. Hmm. It was it was just fun to do. And at the time, everybody was, you know, except for the kerfluffle over negotiations between Fox and Allen about something totally unrelated to that show. 
everybody participated thoroughly. It was a it was a bunch of grown-ups. I was on other shows and I worked on other movies and stuff and I've been around a lot of people, but never around a group of people that you could say and be confident that these were actually grown-up adult people who cared about you and themselves and and the work. And it was just a that was a universal feeling of all those people and it just is a, it's the strangest thing cuz I've never seen it anywhere else. Not in this not in television, not in movies, not in show business, not even in life. <laughs> I've seen that many people in agreement with trying to do something and like you say do it as good as you can or if not better. I I think it goes back to to the management skills of Gene Reynolds. Yeah, it does. Um, I think Jamie told you that in your interview with him too, mm-hmm. about the way disagreements were handled in a respectful manner. Yeah. I'm sure there were times when people weren't happy about this or that, but yeah, they were grownups. There, there weren't any tantrums or any crazy behavior that people would freak out about. Again, I, you know, I keep saying this and it probably gets really dull. I find myself bored saying it, but it was an extraordinary experience. It just was. I, I Like I said, I've never experienced anything like that before or since. Did you did you have that same kind of feeling? Was that sort of, did you walk away from that saying, I get this? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I may not have been mature enough myself to, to recognize that at the time I was doing it. Okay. And you, and you can see it more in retrospect and you hear people talk about it. And then I, I was fortunate enough to know where it came from. You know, you start with Gene Reynolds and, and Larry Gelbart and no, they've got the experience and the credibility to say, this is how we're going to do this. This is how we're going to make this company run. And they did it. They did. This has been great. Thank you for spending some time with us today as we land this plane or chopper, as it were. (laughs) Why do you think MASH matters? Um, It shows people caring about each other from the very beginning in small ways and in big ways. I, I, I may personally be more affected by it and attracted to it because of my experiences in Vietnam. And even though, yes, it was, you know, a situation comedy, they respected what military personnel go through to do the job they've been given. And they didn't treat anybody. You know, I hate it when politicians talk about troops. You know, we're, we're going to send 6,000 more troops over there, like at 6,000 more rifles or 6,000 more tanks or 6,000 more MRAPs or whatever. You know, a troop is a person. And MASH really respected the individual person. The soldiers they were treating and the people that were part of the, the MASH 4077. Very well said. Well, hey, Michael, I, we can't thank you enough for being here. We appreciate this. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to really enjoy hearing you talk about your experiences, as certainly I have. And just so anybody is curious, Michael has written, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven books. So please go to Amazon, look up Michael Hirsch and and buy all seven books. H-I-R-S-H, no C. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The one book, the MASH-like book is titled uh, Fly Unzip. Well, I'm going to go right to Amazon and order 400 copies of that right now. Because- Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's, is there anything else you'd like to say in closing about Mash? Uh, n- no, I think I've, I've, I've already said too much. <laughs> <laughs> You can find a link to purchase Michael's book, and you can find links to other interesting articles about things we talked about today at mashmatterspodcast.com. Just click on this episode and look at the show notes. Until next time, here's looking up your old address. 